Aha. All right. Hello. Um, I see some new faces and new names, so I will introduce myself. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong Vermont. And welcome to Brain Club. Let me share screen. And I'm not even going to bother closing the other 40 tabs that are open because I think it's okay. Kind of. Okay, really, be on the right tab. Okay, we're all right. Share. All right, so this month at Brain Club, um, and, and for those who are new to Brain Club, this is our weekly community conversation on everyday life stuff. Um, so spring cleaning, we mean in the metaphorical sense, we're like actually not cleaning. I haven't actually cleaned anything in like whoever knows how long. We're talking about, you know, metaphorically shedding of ideas. So all month long, different each week, like what no longer serves you? Um, what are some old ideas or some old habits or some old ways of seeing the world that are not really working, um, which is, you know, we, we have this conversation uh, every week at Brain Club. We just call it something different. So anyway, um, but this week we're going to be talking about what no longer serves us with regard to education. So um, just before we, before we jump into the topic and I introduce our panelists, so we're joined by our community panelists this week, um, just some introductions. So all forms of participation are okay here. You, as many of you have figured out already, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we do not expect anything of you. We certainly don't need you to look at the camera, you know, walk, move, fidget, stim, eat, leave, come back, and everyone is welcome. And all communication is okay. You can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat. You can gesture. You can do all the above. Um, just a word about language. Um, you'll hear me um, if I use if I use this term, which I'm often speaking about my own identity. So um, I use the term autistic um, because um, I am autistic and it's part of my identity. And you may hear other people um, speaking about their neurotype in terms of identity first language. You may also hear people talking about their neurotype in person first language. And so you're welcome to speak about speaking with whatever terms about your own identity um, are, 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 are comfortable for you. Because um, certainly it's not a it's not a one it's, it's not a one size fits all for anything. Um, safety comes first here at Brain Club. So in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, it's really important to us that we respect and protect one another's access needs, what everyone needs to meaningfully and fully participate and whatever that means to them. And, 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 I'll, and on our next slide, we're going to talk more about that. But the last thing I'll say here is that uh, just as a reminder, this is an educational event. It's not a medical or therapeutic event. So individual traumatic experiences are best processed in a therapeutic setting, which, of which Brain Club is not. So back to access. So um, because we all have different brains who communicate, think, learn, process differently, um, in order to create space and time for a broad range of communication access needs, we may periodically pause to just give give space for, 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 for people to enter the conversation if they choose to. Um, there's no pressure at all to directly communicate during, during Brain Club at all. Observation is a completely valid form of participation. And there may be people who want to share some ideas, but if the conversation's like ping-ponging too quickly, it's hard to like insert oneself into conversation. That's why giving processing space and time um, is important. So we will do that. Okay, last bit of access. Closed captioning is enabled. You just need to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you can click either the live transcript closed captioning icon. And if you don't see that, try the more dot, dot, dot and choose show subtitles. And you can do the same. If you change your mind, hide subtitles to turn them off. Okay. So what no longer serves us in education? So um, I'm gonna share a quote um, that Sarah pulled for us from John Holt. Um, uh, Children learn from anything and everything they see. 
They learn wherever they are, not just in special learning places. And I think um, as, as we reimagine so many things, um, it's a, it's a, the invitation might come from just rethinking what, what education is about. Um, and as we think about uh, reimagining the uh, the default part of that is 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 learning from kids. Kids have a lot of really amazing ideas, and I think that one of the one of the things that we will hear, or one of the themes that I think we'll hear from our our panelists, because they're all they're they're all returning panelists. We're very very uh, thrilled to have returning panelists uh, today. Um, um, and that that I think is is one of the themes that that we'll hear about. So um, our four panelists today. Um, so we have our um, asynchronous panelists: um, uh, Cecilia Porton and Vicky Senny, uh, educators from Turtle Island Children's Center. We have Anna Howes, who is an early childhood educator um, as well as a family coach. Um, and Melissa Anderson, who is a social emotional learning coach um, here in Montpelier, as well as a special educator. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and tell you a little bit more. And like maybe what we can do is maybe I'll do the thing where I spotlight all of you as panelists and um, and you can just melt. Is yeah. there a way you could put your camera down a little bit? It's, we can't see like the bottom of your face. Well, I can't, but I'm yeah. a little... What, what I probably need to do um, is raise my chair. There we go. Yes, um, there you are. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's an internal conflicting access need thing because I have a desktop. And so in order to be at eye level, it's this trade-off because I'm act I think I actually make people dizzy when I'm too low on the screen because of like the, you know, the, the lines anyway. So it's like this nonstop of like, um, can you see me? No, I have to raise you. Oh, well, I can't reach the mouse anymore, but it's all right. So it's like, it's this, it's this balance all day long. All right. So thanks so much for sure. All right. So I am going to spotlight Anna and spotlight Melissa. I think Jen does not have internet. Oh, um, add spotlight. So maybe what we can do is um, we can hear from Anna and Melissa and then we'll pause and play a recording with Vicki and Cecilia and then we'll have plenty of time for conversation. Awesome. Um, so uh, we can uh, we can we can do any any number of things. Um, you know, I I I I, I think that um, as we shift away from the idea of school being you know only one way to learn for for students, I wonder like what do you think about that? And you know. Yeah, I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> uh, and I also, <clears throat> I appreciated you sending the questions along. So it kind of gave me like, as I was writing down some thoughts when I was reading those, it was really helpful. And I think you're right. The theme that I kind of came up with on my own, so it's interesting, Mel, you mentioned this, was that the kids are the, the educators, um, which is why I think I love teaching and stay in teaching because they come up with the best ideas. So if you know how to elicit the answers and ask the right questions, uh, their ideas just, they blow my mind every single time. I do a lot of restorative circles with kids. You know, maybe two kids got in an argument on a playground or there might be a group of four people who are really struggling to get along. And so we sit down, we have these conversations using the restorative circle type model. And basically that's, you sit down, you talk about what the problem is, and then you brainstorm solutions and you pick a couple of them and really dive deeper into them. But 
I could not make up these things that the kids say. I mean, the, the solutions that they come up with are so kind. They're so forgiving. They work, you know, they, they have ownership in them. So when they leave the circle, they actually go back and implement the things that they come up with. So, you know, it just my, as far as like shedding of ideas, you know, I always thought like, I'm the teacher, I have the experience. I know what I can tell them what they need to do. But once I let go of that idea, um, I, my mind was just opened up to these kids brains that are absolutely amazing. That is amazing. And I would, I, I'd like us to come back to the restorative circle concept, um, because I, that, that is, that is really cool and really interesting. We've been hearing a lot about that from others over the last couple of months. And anyway, I'd love to come back to that because I think it's, I think it's really powerful. Anna, what do you think? Um, is there one right way to learn? <laughs> well, I'm just excited to be a returning panelist because um, the first panel I was on with All Brains Belong was about um, my experience as an adult living with dyslexia. And um, I think that school was really hard for me as a kid because um, I was you know, I, I was going through school in a time when um, the idea was to try to kind of, you know, m sort of force a round peg into a square hole. You know, there was there was only one way to learn. And I found a lot of coping mechanisms for that. And and being on the panel for All Brains Belong was one of the first times I had articulated some of that stuff, realizing how much I had um, created, you know, these kind of like I don't know what else to call it aside from masking. That's what you all have, have taught me to call it. But it was like these coping mechanisms became the person was was the person that I became. And it's taken a lot for me to get back to like how I authentically learn and how I authentically like to express myself, um, what comes most naturally to me. And um so and I love, 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 love what Melissa said about the kids being the teacher, because one of the one of the things that transformed my life as a teacher. And I, I want to start by saying I remember very clearly in middle school thinking I will never be a teacher. Teachers are the worst. Right. And this was like at the height of my educational career of masking. <laughs> um, I was like, they are awful. And then only like three years later, I was like, I want to be a teacher. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, I've, I have spent a lot of time in education and one of the, one of the pivotal moments was for me was when I started to imagine or kind of dismantle this old paradigm thought that like children are these empty vessels that need to be like filled with information. And so the teacher's job is to like give them the facts. Um, and that was kind of the hardest part for me growing up and learning was that like all these facts were laid out for me um, to memorize and the way my brain works, it doesn't like file things in that clear like memorizational order. Um, I had to come up with a lot of tricks to recall that information. Um, and then, you know, come now 25 years later, I'm like, oh, I, I know that stuff. I know it deep within myself. I don't have to memorize facts and figures, all these things that made me feel so unsmart. And so, you know, I only wish that I had a teacher who was able to, to see, you know, what I now see, which is that, in fact, children are these whole complete beings that just need the right soil and, you know, sunlight and watering just to blossom, like their own wisdom within them can, can unfold when they give them spaces like a restorative circle. And I also want to talk more about that, um, because that just sounded amazing. I wrote it down and I was like, wow, you know, like when we give kids the space, it's like all of a sudden all this wisdom just pours from them. Um, and I remember early on with my daughter who just turned 17, um, you know, she's like this tiny little thing, two and a half years old saying profound wisdom. And we would say, how do you know that? Oh, I just know, <laughs> three years old, I just know. <laughs> no, you don't, you don't even know how to read. How, how could you know that? But now that I've embraced this concept, it's like, I start to understand how, 
her brain makes meaning of the world and how she knows and understands things. And the more respect and recognition I give her um, to have autonomy in her own education, um, the more profound wisdom seems to just pour from her her being. Um, and so I wanted to close by saying my my favorite book that I bought recently is titled Raising Free People. And the woman who wrote it, um, I've I, I follow her on social media and I'm now also a member of her Patreon because I love all the content she's providing. And one of the terms that she's coined is called schoolishness. And so she's like, how do we, like, how do we examine our own schoolishness? Um, you know, these kind of, um, these ideas that we have around, you know, power over and authoritarian concepts of adults, like, you know, having to, you um, uh, kind of direct everything and how do we kind of unpack that and leave more space for, um, you know, sort of more natural unfolding of learning as a lifestyle, learning as an everyday occurrence. Um, thank you. Mel just put the link to my website on there. So um, I just, I love providing um, resources for families who want to unpack this stuff um, within their households, as well as educators um, who want to just like keep um, evolving with the ideas of how to continuously create more spaces for for kids to be in that, um, you know, in in an environment in which they really truly feel like their brain belongs. <laughs> so I think that that's really special, and we might see something that we've never seen before <laughs> happen if we can really create those kinds of spaces. Thanks for inviting me to be on the panel. Anna, thanks for recommending a book. I'm gonna recommend one as well. Um, one that I wish that I could carry copies around in my purse and hand them out to every single person mm. who talks to children. Um, it's called Good Inside by Dr. Becky Kennedy. Um, and it's just a really good resource for how to respectfully talk to kids and provide, you know, ask them questions and talk to them in a way that gives them the autonomy of figuring things out for themselves. So instead of, you know, the adult putting the parameters in place and saying, do one of these things, the, the, the technique that, and, and the way that she uses it is so respectful and it's just, it's absolutely amazing. I've read it three times already because it's more for um, parents of younger kids, but I have teenagers. And just when I'm like, is this the book I really need? She'll say something in the book like, you may think it's too late. It's not. Keep reading. Um, so yeah, it, uh, I'm going to check out your recommendation, Anna, but also I wanted to put that one in there. Thanks for post posting the link, Mel. Thank you. I love that. One of my favorite phrases to just constantly come back to is, I wonder, you know, I, I it's my favorite thing is to instill this sense of wonder in every moment with kids. Um, and, you know, even just being able, like you said, just the, the process of like asking questions and giving space and waiting for their answers. Um, so anytime I find myself wanting to like insert my own opinion, I step back and I'm like, what, how can I start this sentence with, I wonder? <laughs> it is such hard work. It's such hard work as the adult to like bite your tongue and not insert yourself. I mean, it's like very intentional and you have to think about it carefully every single time. And I would also say that when you say, I wonder, you have to actually be wondering because sometimes I wonder is used as like a manipulative tool of like mm -hmm. I wonder but like you don't really wonder you're just trying to like mm -hmm. manipulate someone so um as the parent of a pda -er and a pda -er myself um I can smell a foe I wonder like none other and so can Luna anyway so uh Christina's saying oh yeah now my daughter picks up on that right away yeah yeah um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to play the video from just, uh, from, from Vicky and Cecilia are working with the, 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 the tiniest of the little ones, like the under fives. So, um, let's see. So we were talking about education through the lifespan. All right. So open. 
and then share screen quick with sound. Okay. So we're here today with um, with Vicki and Cecilia, who both work at Turtle Island Children's Center. And um, we're talking today, Vicki and Cecilia, about sort of zooming out. Um, this whole month is about, you know, metaphorical spring cleaning, kind of moving past some of the paradigms that maybe we grew up with, um, maybe our training even was in, and kind of learning how to zoom out and view the bigger picture. Um, and I know that Turtle Island is very intentional about setting a space that feels welcoming for the children and the staff. So I'd love to hear more about that. You know, how do you metaphorically, you know, spring clean and create a space that's so welcoming? It's a great question. I, I think, you know, it's definitely something that needs, like you said, intentionality um, and is not something that happens overnight. Um, yeah. And it takes a, a variety of folks working together. Um, I think for me, the biggest part of it, whether we're talking about the physical environment or sort of the, you know, metaphorical environment, um, is it comes down to, to respect for humans. Um, mm -hmm. So whether they're our youngest humans or, you know, teacher humans or mm -hmm. any kind of human, um, respect is sort of the first foundation that we work with. Mm -hmm. And that might look like respecting the child to, enough to set up the environment that encourages their learning. Mm -hmm. um, it could look like, you know, creating a space where teachers are able to um, call the housing and development uh, office if that's something that they need to do. Um, mm -hmm. Because we are all human and that's where we're operating from and there's all this interconnectivity. So it doesn't make sense anymore to focus on the individual and perpetuate individualism. Um, for us, it makes sense to work together because we're all connected mm -hmm. as humans and to this to this earth. Yeah. yeah, and we, you know, with this topic of spring cleaning and what no longer serves us as humans and just as people in the world who have this idea that we are, we want to connect to humanity, we see children and people of all ages as human. Um, it does require that consistent spring cleaning in our brains, kind of like, and it, it does require, I think, assessing, especially as like, you know, Cecilia and I are the administrators here. And so we always have to question like our own um, behaviors, our own words, the things we're saying, our own actions. And it is constant. It, like you said, it's not a like one and done situation. It's constantly assessing the things that I say. Like this morning you said. Oh yeah, I, I had a moment where I said something to a child, like I need you to do this. And I caught myself and said, like, what, what does that even mean? And there, you know, and I've been doing this work for a very long time and still reassessing, reflecting, what am I saying? What is my intention? Do those things match up? And then do my actions also match with that? And it's like, we've all been, well, you know, most of us have sort of received the same kind of ideas about the world um through how we've we've grown up and still like how that's perpetuated through stories through media through school you know um and so to get to the bottom of that it just requires i think lifelong work because it's so embedded um and but as long as it's coming from a place of love love for humans and love for each other and compassion for yourself too you know because we could easily like beat ourselves up for saying the wrong thing or you know, did I do that right? Did I, because it happens to me constantly and that's probably a good thing, you know, because I'm, I'm in practice with children and with teachers. Sometimes I respond in a way that is not my ideal. Um, you know, and so I, I will reflect and there are days where I really feel bad about, you know, how I responded and I want to go back and, and redo it. Fortunately, as humans, we're also forgiving of each other and welcoming the next day. Mm -hmm. um and so it's, it's just kind of about that that understanding um that, oops, sorry about that no problem oh it's okay um and the other you know i wanted to just <clears throat> reiterate what vicky said about that internal work yeah. we talk a lot about um you have to put the oxygen mask on first yes. and that idea of that i think also a lot of us have been part of society that does not invite us to reflect on our own um, moves and and to look internally 
an unlearn maybe if that's what's happening. Um, and that is a really, really important piece. And I think as caregivers, a lot of us can say we're really good at helping others with their needs, but we're maybe not so good at doing that for ourselves. Um, and again, I think that's another thing. If you are going to invite a child to join you in something, that's respectful, but you should be respecting yourself as well as a human, as that, that human connection. Um, and we're all doing this together. And we the, the thing that has felt really important about our, our space is that it's over time that we're having conversations together and we're collaboratively problem solving with one another or, you know, inviting the children to collaboratively problem solve. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a lot of connection. It's a lot of constant talking and reflecting and making a different choice. Um, again, whether that's working with the children or for ourselves solving things. Um, and I think for so long, we've been in a world that hasn't even invited us to like put our heads up to see what's going on. And I'm excited to say that I feel more and more that that's, that's changing, particularly in <clears throat> where we are. And then this small group of, of brain club, I feel so sort of inspired because I can recognize that people are really trying to examine these things that we've learned yeah. and say, this doesn't serve us anymore and we don't have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. We can change it. We yeah. can flip yeah. the perspective. Yeah. Um, because we have power and we do have agency as humans um, and collectively we have much more power and agency to be able to do some of those things. Yeah, we ever since All Brains came along or that we first learned about All Brains, I think we were just so jazzed because, um, you know, finally it just feels like the conversation is being lifted up. Mm -hmm. everybody's normal you know there is no normal or everybody's yeah. normal and um yeah. that feels so so huge yeah because uh, yeah. we're can you check in with we're up against so much um in terms of that Great. just Thanks. having that idea that and it's very sad yeah. that, like that's not the common idea in the world but yeah um when i've been thinking a lot lately about you know in early childhood in this particular work there are certain developmental stages that children have to reach mm -hmm. of course mm -hmm. according to you know what people came up with many years ago typically a white male scientist or whatever it was mm -hmm. and then there are and then once they leave the early childhood realm they're they're up against these standards that they have to meet in order to move on to the next and all of these stages and standards and it's like i keep looking at these kids and they just want to live in the world that that that, that exists you know they want to do stuff that matters they want to like ha have meetings with us about real things. They want to put their hands and their bodies and minds to work. Mm -hmm. And here we are, you know, like just I'm just saying that because it's like such a huge force that we're up against in this okay. in all of these systems that kind of cross over, like the education system, the healthcare system, all of those things. Yeah. Um. And we and and it's just like we we just want to let them live and play and learn about their world that exists instead of coming in and saying here are the things you have to meet in this world by the way this world doesn't work for most people like most people can't afford to live in this world with a family like most people are really struggling and but we're still saying that these are the standards we need to meet to live in this world and the children i think they know better and they're really teaching us a lot about that but it is a a lot of we're just up against a lot of forces when we're trying to um constantly do this kind of spring cleaning uh, these ideas in, in our in our mind and i would say one of those things in particular is this idea you know bad behavior or these you know behavior problems that you hear and we you know we talk about this a lot um yeah. but from a perspective that respects that the child is trying to communicate something through that um they are humans and they are on this world, but they've been on this world for a short amount of time. So there are still things that we can offer to support them as they do this. Um, so they shouldn't be experts in regulating their emotions or solving a problem on their own. Um, and that's one of the things I've found has completely, I've completely flipped my perspective upside down on on behaviors um, and really looking them at looking at them as a communication tool. And I would say the yeah. same is for adults. Mm -hmm. There are some yeah. adult behaviors again um, 
that are really indicative of something else. And for us, it feels really important to think about what's happening sort of at the root to, to, to make this behavior happen and then solve that as opposed to throw a Band-Aid on the, on the behavior or exclude a child because they're being physical um, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Um, with, I mean, just as, as we're, we've been talking about, just with people struggling, um, even just struggling to afford to live or to, to buy food or anything like that, so just like if a children yeah. or if a child comes in and and is is struggling or maybe has a meltdown of some form, something's going on and 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 we see them as as struggling or or needing support. We don't see them as bad or purposefully doing anything. Mm -hmm. And I think with adults too, we have to see when somebody is behaving a certain way um, or you know, generally yeah. just like we can identify oh maybe they're struggling and they need something and so that's how we approach it again just kind of like out of love and connection to this fellow human instead of out of um seeing them as sort of purposefully making a mistake or yeah. doing something wrong i think yeah. that's the other paradigm that i've seen shift to is this sort of yeah. right wrong dichotomy um which isn't serving anyone because someone's bound to be left out and that's a very um subjective so you know just thinking thinking more along those lines of supporting supporting that yeah yeah no that's beautiful this has been a really great conversation thank you so much for helping us sort of zoom out and look at you know early childhood through uh, uh with a paradigm shift you know on behaviors i think it's really important work that you're doing so thank you very much for your time thanks so much sarah thanks so much sarah. Hopefully we'll see you there and okay Tell everyone we said Thank hi. You. Thank I you. Lovely. Um, so, uh, Sarah, by the way, you are totally in charge of Brain Club interviews from now on. Um, <laughs> I can't believe you didn't have to edit that or anything. It was just like, I did it. I, the hardest part was looking at the clock because I could talk to Vicki and Cecilia all day and they have yeah. such great points. I, it was, it, that was the hardest part. Yes. All right, hold on. I'm gonna take the spotlight off so we can just open up conversation. And I'm I'm curious because I know that there are actually a, a few a few educators in the audience too. Anyway, we can just open up this conversation. What's come up for folks? What do you what do you think about these ideas? And I mean truly open to everyone, whether or not you're an educator or 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 a parent or have anything to do with children accessing education. I just don't want to hear from anybody. Um, I have, I just had an interesting conversation recently with my daughter, um, and she brought up the concept of power and it comes up a lot in conversations with educators and, um, she had a lot to say about, um, distribution of power and she was saying how she feels sometimes that there's that that every she said everybody should have power everybody should have their own power and everybody should have power together and she said that sometimes she sees like how parents or teachers or whatever um seem to assume that they have more power than the kids do and she said you know power is like but she wrote while that it was skill it's like um you know somebody could be really powerful in one specific topic if you give them the right topic but if you give them the wrong topic the wrong fit they're not going to be really great at that particular thing so it's if she was like saying like you know just saying that like it 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 seems like the teachers or whatever some person that sees themselves as authority figure sort of handing down things to them that are ill fit and she feels like that the students should be able to assert their own power and 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 like own it so she was this is a comment that she she shared with me I actually recorded the whole conversation because it was interesting but anyway she had a lot to say about power distribution she did she's amazing um so 
it, it, it's almost like she's talking about autonomy, right? So power over self, right? So if, if someone is power over you, that interferes with your ability to have power over yourself. Um, and that is what is happening all over the place. Um, so, and I agree, Sarah, Sarah says in the chat, such a wise, sweet little love you have. Yes, I agree. Um, and I, 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 I think, and, and Melissa's adding, that is similar to Anna's idea of children being, being vessels to fill rather than individual beings who have ideas to share. David says, yes to listening to the wisdom of children. My granddaughter at age four or so went through a time when she'd answer most questions, I don't know, with a great smile. Wonderful. I fear she'll all too often begin to know and then eventually have to find a way back to not knowing. Oh, so beautifully said. Um, it's kind of like um, a couple months ago, um, one of our volunteers, who's a medical student, Elizabeth Barker and I, we did an interview. Um, we did a podcast interview about um, neuroinclusive medical education. Um, we were actually talking about ableism in medical education, but we oblique angled it. And, um, and, and we talked about um, how fake it till you make it um, which is like really a big part of medical training. I mean, it's a big part of a lot of training in a lot of different fields. It's a lot of, it's like a big message of society. It's like, so it's so unhelpful. It's so bad for brains. It's so bad for society. Anyway, fake it till you make it um, interferes with someone being able to say, I don't know. It is so profoundly important to say when you don't know. Um, uh, Luna and I, we've been watching a lot of super monsters lately. That's like the new mini monotropic focus. Um, and there's this episode where there's a character who's like pretending to know stuff. So Luna says, why is she pretending to know? She clearly doesn't know. Why did she just say she doesn't know? I know. Melissa says, I don't know is where all the magic happens. Absolutely. So, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because so much of this wisdom um, is only able to be accessed when you give time and space and autonomy and all these raw ingredients um, for the sweet little loves being able to express their true selves, but they also need access to upstairs brain, meaning their cortex. Um, we all need access to our cortex. So like in my house, um, the language that, that I will use sometimes is like, you don't have access to my cortex right now. I tell my husband that like on the regular. Um, and uh, so, so it's like cortex to cortex has to be communicating. And that's like not happening a lot of the time. As long as somebody is dysregulated in a dyad, a conversation is not going to be effective. So I'm wondering if anyone has thoughts about um, uh, why is it that um, we are holding downstairs brain to upstairs brain standards so often? It's not just in school, it's at home, it's in all society, but like it is definitely happening in school. I think I need you to say more. Can you say more about that in school setting? Like, or maybe um, can? Yeah. So like if I'm a kid and I am, you know, talking incessantly or I like, or I, you know, I have some kind of behavior, some kind of behavior. And it's like, well, you should know better. Um, you know, as, th as though the kid has like complete control over the thing, because it's not like, I mean, they didn't make a choice to do the thing. Choices come from upstairs brain, a regulated cortex. Um, it is mostly a, a lot of, a, a lot of behavior is just communication of someone's underlying physiologic state, um, which is like, I don't have my access needs met, so I am under threat. And like, that's what comes out. Um, it's the way of signaling to the people around you that you don't have your access needs met. And yet the shame mm -hmm. that gets inflicted um, from uh, about things that as though they were done with like, you know, you know, honestly, you know, that, you know, I'm weighing the pros and the cons and like, this is the decision I'm going to make. Like, that's not how it happens. Anna. 
Yeah, I, I think this, Mel, connects a lot to what Cecilia and Vicky were talking about, right? Like they they kind of like were able to articulate a bit about how this can, you know, uh, reframing it in an early childhood setting. Um, because then you'd think at least then it's pretty obvious that like, I mean, the child's only been on the planet for three years. Like they, <laughs> you know, um, and they, so they kind of use the language like, they shouldn't, they shouldn't have to, we shouldn't have to assume that they have the skills to, you know, to be regulated or to regulate themselves that, um, you know, that as adults, um, you know, we can have this like opportunity to actually model for children what it's like to be regulated and what, why I think this thing that you're saying is happening in schools, right? Where especially in schools, especially as kids get to be like second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, um, and then middle school when their brains are like completely exploding. And then all of a sudden everyone's like, you should, you should know better than this. So you're practically an adult, you know, and there's like all this pressure, <laughs> really, they're just like giant toddlers. Um, but I think that some of the pressure comes and um, from the fact that actually the teachers are under so much stress that it can be really, really hard even for the teachers to get through a day feeling calm, cool, collected, regulated, like in that rest and digest. It just doesn't happen that often for educators, at least educators that I know, um, especially early educators, because they're so poorly paid. They're, you know, they're um, often living with toxic stress in their daily personal lives. And then that comes into the classroom. Um, and so it can be really, really difficult for us, you know, and actually I heard Gabor Mate talking about this too, with the medical, right. Being in medical school is so stressful that you then become a stressed out, um, doctor. And I feel like teachers are kind of in that same position where they're under so much constant stress, um, and pressure that they get into a situation in which like the expectations are that everybody just like get their stuff together. Um, and so it's, yeah, they're just shaming and shooting all over each other. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, again, coming back to what Cecilia and Vicky were talking about, I mean, it's so incredible to hear a director of a program talk about self-compassion um, talk about, you know, what it takes to be supportive to their, um, their staff, to create a supportive environment, no matter what people's needs are, um, really understanding that when we're, when we are dysregulated, right, there's an access need that's not being met, there's a need that's not being met, or th that they're trying to communicate. Um, and when we can give that compassion also to the adults, um, that can be really important. And, um, and just one last thought that's been on my mind that I think needs to be like some spring cleaning attention on um, is that we also have a lot of our reactions, a lot of dysregulation, um, you know, in these like knee jerk reactions or the phrases that just roll off our tongue that come from our past. Um, they can be triggered. They can be triggered by someone who like reminds us of someone from our past as well. And I think that that happens for teachers a lot, um, that a child might remind them of the bully that they, you know, were bullied by in elementary school. And so they're already making an assumption about this child based on past experience with someone who maybe looks similar or said something similar. And then, and then it's like, all of a sudden, all of those like automatic phrases start coming now. Who do you think you are? Like, get your act together. You know, all these things that we've all heard so many times. And even the, with the best intentions, sometimes um, when you're in that triggered place, um, you know, through transference or, or something like that, where you just have this haunting, um, maybe not even conscious memory of something that was really painful for you, it can be really difficult to... Um, to be able to have compassion in those moments. And those are some of the things that I think the majority of educators aren't taught, but I'd be curious to hear from some of the current educators, if there are any in this space, um, how they handle that kind of stuff. Yeah, trauma lives in the body, Mel wrote in the chat, yeah. Um, thank you, Anna. I, I had a couple of things that I connected with, uh, with what you said. And one of them is, 
the stress that teachers are under, just taking that perspective of thinking about all of the initiatives and all of the academics and all of the things that they're required to do, the curriculum they're supposed to teach, and there's not a lot of time in the day. So teachers feel like they need to press through these curriculum. Um, and I, I don't know if they, one, they haven't been taught, some haven't been taught that it's okay to pause in a moment where you could do some reflection on some social emotional learning, you know, education, modeling it with the whole class. I mean, the, the, it seems to be like, it's like, okay, let's have a half an hour for guidance class or a half an hour for social emotional learning and move on with our day and do our math and do our reading and, and, and the social emotional learning and the understanding of our emotions and the responses to our emotions is something that really needs to be integrated throughout the entire day. And, and I really feel like most teachers haven't had the training on how to do that. Um, and so it's just, it's a really hard place to be when they're thinking, here's the expectation from me and I need to do this good job. And teachers are amazing in trying to manage their time and do all those things, but how can we um, teach them how to, to make those things more integrated? And just the idea about kids do better when they can, teachers also do better when they can. What, you know, as my, my role as a learning, uh, social learning coach, when I'm working with teachers, it's like you see the light bulbs go off and they're, and I'm explaining, this is why we are saying it, this is why we're doing it this way, this is why we're modeling it this way. And they're like, oh, oh, this makes so much sense. Like, I, I had a teacher in my office today, crossing arms, he needs a consequence. And I was explaining all this stuff, like you can't just throw a consequence after the behavior has happened because he wasn't able to make the conscious choice. If I make this choice and this choice that may not be the best choice, I know what my consequence is. You cannot implement that after the fact. It's like throwing out these tickets, you know, that you didn't know you were going to get. Uh, and she kind of, I don't know if that makes sense for people, but um, she kind of stood back and was like, okay, I see. And I was like, now we can say, if you call someone names, this is the, you know, this is what might happen. We'll have to do some repair work. And this is what it's going to look like. Very clearly saying to the kid, you know, so that when they decide to make a choice to call someone a name or something, they're going to know, okay, I made, I called someone a name. Here's what's going to happen. Here's the repair work. This is what it's going to look like. Um, so teachers do better when they can, but the problem is time. So how, when are they learning these things and when are they practicing these things and when are they getting feedback on these things um, to help them move forward in that um, and to help them feel better, not so stressed out in school. Um, and, and one other thing I just wanted to say before I pass to someone else is one of the things that I've come across is traditional ways of responding to unexpected behaviors are punishments and consequences. And there's still quite a few people who are like, well, what's the consequence? What's the rest restitution? What are they going to get for doing this? Instead of stepping over the behavior and really looking for what's causing the behavior to begin with, which you, there's lots of ways you can do that. One of them being CPS, um, Ross Green collaborative and proactive solutions, conversations with kids to help them share their wisdom. Um, and what I've come across is kids come into my office or my space with me and I try to make it as warm and friendly as possible. And they're terrified. You know, kids who don't know me, they think they're in trouble. You know, their, their eyes are this big. And so I start the circle with like giving them some toys and talking to them. You're not in trouble. It's okay. We're going to work through this together. By the time we're done, they, they've calmed down. But their initial response to having a conversation that's hard is I'm in trouble. What's going to happen to me? Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm really on a mission to change that, <laughs> change that for kids. Oh, that's all just so amazing to hear. The other thing I'll add to what you've said about, I mean, like, I, I, I can't even imagine what it's like to be a teacher. Like, I can't even have two kids in my exam room at the same time without my brain exploding, let alone like, oh, just like the sensory chaos of most classrooms. And because most people are not talking about sensory processing, I think that there's maybe some 
so just even unrecognized impact of the environment on the adults in the environment. And I put a link in the chat to an old brain club about this. Hannah Bloom is an occupational therapist talking about stuff in your environment you don't realize is stressing you out. So I just like just that 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 is a conversation that I think I think needs to be had. Sensory processing is not just for kids with like an identified neurodevelopmental disability. Like we all have sensory processing systems. We all have brains. So like this is something that I wish what I would like to see is that this is part of like talk like this is like part of preschool. Um, so like, you know, Luna's, Luna's grown up talking about her sensory systems like her whole life. And so I, I just, I think that would be an important piece of socio-emotional learning um, is like understanding how your brain works um, and Mel, this stuff. I, yeah, go I got so much out of um, you describing like all the different senses that go beyond like the five senses we teach kids. Like I could just imagine how valuable that would be first for educators and then for kids to learn about like all those different layers of our system that's taking in information. Um, it's, it's just so empowering to understand that stuff. Thank you. I, I absolutely. And so, you know, this is, these are, um, and, and, you know, ABB does um, a lot of educational trainings. And so um, I can think of last year, we did a training for uh, an independent school about this stuff and specifically how to talk about these topics with students. Anyway, they, they ended up creating like an experiential work, set of workshops for their students in a K through for um, a school about sensory processing because this like this impacts literally everybody. Um, I'm gonna put a link in the chat. This is from a brain club um, on like discussing neurodiversity with kids. I love how you have all these brain clubs at your fingertips. Thank you. Well, it's only because of the Brain Club 2022 guide. We had some volunteers who put this together. Um, I'll put that in the chat too. So like at Brain Club, we have this document open, like at the ready. So something comes up and I'd be like, Control F, neurodiversity, and then it'll find there's, there's a brain a, club for that. Ah, there's a, <laughs> yeah, there's a brain club for everything. Once you have, like, you know, we're 15 months into brain club, like we got a lot of archives now. Um, this is the whole directory. Um, so yeah. there's a couple of things I just want to poke in right now, which is that this thing, like we don't all have to be good at all the things. And I talked about this in reimagining education. I think this is a big spring cleaning moment for us of like, what does not serve us? Like we don't need every single child to get an A plus in every single subject. Like, let's just stop doing that, you know, the, and the standardized tests that came up earlier. Um, and one of the things that made me think of that is because this idea of not knowing. I got so used to pretending I knew because I couldn't bear to like have the embarrassment of being caught in the classroom not knowing that I find myself as an adult in conversations. People are like, oh, you know, it's something really silly. Like, oh, this movie with such and such an actor. Like, those are the kinds of things my brain doesn't categorize. Like, I don't memorize those kinds of things. And I'll just say, oh, yeah, yeah, I totally, you know, like, pretending I know what they're talking about. And they'll be like, oh, you know that one? I'm like, no, actually, I don't. <laughs> Actually, I don't. I've gotten, I've had to like rewire my habit on that. And one of the things that has um, really helped is my kids, like my kids in my classroom, my, my own children. Um, it, they've helped me get more comfortable saying, I don't know. Let's figure it out. Let's find out together. Um, but one of the things my brain does awesome. So what you were saying, like you just have a couple of kids and you're like, ah, I'm like 35, three-year-olds, bring it on. I'm ready. I'm at the ready. And it's because my brain, like I love untangling knots, like a jewelry box that's been neglected for years and has like 500 necklaces in it. Like, oh yes, I can like untangle them all and like figure out which one's which. And like, that's what my brain does in the classroom. It's like, all right, I've got, I've got eyes on like and ears on every student. And I know 
just what they're into and I'm making observations and I'm creating, you know, you know, developing the environment. So it's meeting everyone's access needs. And I'm just like, Oh, like all over the place. And I, I get so fired up in those settings. Like I just love it, but not everybody does. And that's okay. Right? <laughs> so that's how I tied all of that together. But that's been a really important thing for me. My, my two, um, kids at home, my biological kids, they are very different. They, they excel in very different things. And it's taken us a while to say like, it's okay. If you're amazing at math, your sister doesn't have to be as amazing at math at you. She's awesome artist and she loves to write poetry. And like, so that's what she focuses on. You go focus on, you know, building things and calculating things. Like, <laughs> And then we know who to turn to when we need something built or calculated. And we know who to turn to when we want some beautiful art. You know, we all have these amazing skills. Um, and like, so let's stop wasting time trying to, you know, figure out the things we're not good at. <laughs> that's what I, that's what all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you for that. Right. I mean, sh like, like, or like figure out how your brain works and then design your life in a way that works for your brain. That's niche construction. Um, um, uh, to coin, um, or to, 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 to this, the term that Dr. Thomas Armstrong coined, um, that's, that's what we should want for anybody is to have niche construction. And as Sarah said, it takes all types in the village. No, oh, absolutely. Right. That's why we, this is, this is like why we have all different brains. I'm hearing this and I'm like, literally everything you just described as your strengths are like my hardest things for my brain. I'm so glad that you exist in the world. Right. So, so that's, that's what this should be about. Um, and I, and I, 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 I think it's not just, I mean, that frame applies to, to all humans, right? So if we spend all of our time trying to get people to do the thing, that's power over. That's the thing Christina's daughter um, knows is unsafe. Um, that, 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 that's, that doesn't serve anybody. So, um, as Sarah says, spring cleaning education means helping each child discover their natural and unique gifts. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I think also, um, you know, one, one comment that hasn't, that sort of came up, but that didn't really clearly come up yet, um, uh, it is, is around the self-concept piece. So if you grow up receiving the message that there's something about you that needs to be fixed or cured or like significantly changed, that takes its toll. You might, you know, you might be doing like, you know, well enough in school, but you're still getting the message that there's something about you that needs to be changed. That stuff stays. It stays and it has such, I mean, um, as a, as a doctor who takes care of neurodivergent people through the, through the lifespan, I, there's just so many adults, um, who have so, such significant health problems stemming from the messages they got in grade school and you know even you know even myself as an autistic person who like also happens to have this like professional lens of knowing about brains I still inadvertently things fly off the tongue so like Luna hums at the top of her lungs and she like strains her neck muscles because she's humming so hard and she's grinding her teeth while she's humming and this is what goes on and so my brain has this big limbic response every time she does that and even if I don't say anything I am casting the energy. It's like the force field of like, nah, nah, unsafe, unsafe. Because to my brain, it is unsafe because it makes me feel like my brain's going to explode. I can't not have that sensory experience. And I am giving the message that there's something fundamental about her that needs to be changed. And I'm so furious at myself like all day long about that because I, you know, all I can do is put in earphones and hope for the best. But I think this is what goes on like all day everywhere in 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 subtle yet profound ways. 
And as Melissa says, as a mom to a teenager, it's so hard without adding this message of it needs to be fixed. It's intentional and it's hard work to hold my tongue. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Stevie experiences this too. Yeah, it's, it's, it is so hard. So it's like at least the cortical override to like, ooh, pause, oh, don't say the thing. But to be aware, especially with our with our nervous systems that have um, hypersensitive neuroception or threat detection, uh, these are our, these are our PDAers, for example, who have um, you know you, you don't have to say anything. Um, you know we're we're porous to energy. I can feel your energy. I feel your judgment. I feel your vibe, um, and so that that is real. And so all 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 we do in my house about that is just like try to bring some transparency. Like Luna, I, I just want to let you know, I'm having this response to the humming. It's not because there's anything wrong with your humming. This is me and my access needs. I'm going to pop on some headphones. I love you. I love you. And I love your, I love, I want you to, I, I want you to have all your access needs met. And you, you may feel my energy. This is about me and my my sensory processing experience. And like that, I think, I mean, I don't know, but she says that she's like, yeah, I know, I don't care. Um, but I think if I didn't say anything, I think she might've cared. So what I would like to see um, and is, 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 is just, just about everyone talking about their own access needs as though they are, you know, equal. You know, my access needs matter just as, as much as your access needs and vice versa, as opposed to like, like, uh, like Christina's daughter was talking about when there's power dynamics, power over my access needs are become rules. My access needs become policy. My, my access needs become law. Um, that's dangerous. That's power over. That's perpetuation of, of, of oppression. Anna, you want to close us out? I just, you know, as you were talking, this, this thing is bubbling in me and I want to see if I can articulate it because so often I feel like when our access needs aren't met when we're kids and we kind of end up with this like chip on our shoulder, like, well, when I'm an adult, I'll show them, you know, and I see it happen with teachers and I, and I feel it in myself as a parent, you know, in those moments where it's like, I, I actually feel like as an adult, like it's my responsibility actually to provide my child with their access needs. And so sometimes I put that above my own, but then I can start to feel really resent, like some resentment about it. And so one of the things that's been so key for me, and this is, you know, something that I've had a lot of support with a lot of therapy around a lot of different pieces is like being able to like almost go back to my child self and actually like offers that nurturing and offer that, like, I see you and I know your needs weren't met. And like, and now, you know, like almost like convincing myself that there's a new way to be with myself so that I can better have those conversations. Cause you're right. That transparency is so important, but when it happens in a split second and that resentment like flares up in me and I'm like, I'm going to get my needs from that. <laughs> it's the last thing I do, you know, because it's been so many years that that need hasn't been met. And the adults in my life kept reflecting to me for so many years, my teachers, my parents, you know, that there was something wrong with me that needed to be fixed. And uh, it just, there's, it's, there's so many layers. There's so, 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 so many layers. And the more that I've been able to do, you know, and, and again, coming back to what Cecilia and Vicky said, it's just, just so important. The more I've been able to do the work myself, you know, re, you know, give myself just the, the opportunity to even say I have access needs, <laughs> <laughs> and then to maybe see a future or a, or a present moment in which they could possibly be met. Um, it gives me like just that little bit more space to, to be with my kids in a more real way. Um, give them that respect, but I have to give it to myself first. Absolutely. And that is, so uh, there's a question in the chat um, around what is an access need. And thank you for the question. Um, so access needs being anything that anyone needs for full and meaningfully meaningful participation in their activity. And so if I if I'm a wheelchair user, I have an access need for a ramp. Um, but when it comes to um, you know, first off, 
everyone has access needs, not just people with disabilities. Um, it's just that there are people who are more or less likely to have their access needs met by the defaults of society. Um, so if I have the kind of brain that is really sensitive to loud sounds, if I enter a space where there's like a, you know, a fluorescent light buzzing, it's not a loud sound, but it's like, may as well be like, you know, Anyway, um, or uh, like today in my office, there was some like alarm sounding and it like was sounding for an hour. And I'm like, I, I, I have an access need to that sound not be on. So I'm gonna leave. Um, so like that kind of thing. Um, uh, and Kat says conflicting access needs might be the need for quiet to concentrate and the need to bounce and hum to concentrate at the exact same time. Yeah, Luna and I, we have conflicting access needs all the time. Um, and in fact, um, actually when, when um, uh, next week, um, uh, I forget what we're calling it, but we're, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's neuroinclusive employment brain club. We always, it's always the third week of the month we talk about employment and, uh, we're going to, um, we're, we're, we're going to be like taking the curtain down and we're going to, we're going to show, um, some clips of all brains belong staff meetings, um, working through conflicting access needs. Um, cause that is part of spring cleaning of like, at all times we have to both hold and express our access needs and bring some transparency to when they're not being met and there's conflicts because that's like a healthy neuro-inclusive workplace culture. It's not like, it's definitely not easy, but it's just like a commitment to the paradigm that I think is the most important thing. Um, so so with, with that, we, we look forward to seeing you next week. Oh, and Sarah's reminding me. Um, oh yeah, what no longer serves you at work? Yeah, that sounds like something we would call next week. Um, anyway, but um, it, so so often we find um, because very few of us are are, are uh, at a workstation, a computer that has access to an Ethernet cable, which is like when you're when you're playing a streaming video, it's really hard if it's not coming through the Ethernet. So anyway, um, we are wondering if there's anyone who regularly comes to Brain Club that would be interested in like signing up for like, you know, a day here and there to be the backup person when our staff member who has an Ethernet like doesn't make it home from school in time picking up their kids or something like that. Um, so anyway, if, uh, if, if anybody is willing and interested and has access to a computer and like participates on Brain Club from a computer that um, connects to an Ethernet cable uh, or could connect to an Ethernet cable, we would be so grateful. And I'll put our email address in chat.